Professor Sunstein, thank you so much for being here. We're going to talk about your new book on Star Wars. Uh, I've prepared a number of questions. We may end up deviating from some of them. Uh, but first, I think the American Enterprise Institute is a public policy research institute. We're a think tank. So I think we should start by eating our vegetables. Um, and then later on, we can talk about whether Jar Jar was a Sith Lord. So <laughs> my first question, there's a lot of social science in your book. Phrases like network effects, information cascades are sprinkled throughout. What are the most interesting applications of social science to Star Wars, both in the films uh, and in the broader Star Wars phenomenon? I think you put your finger on the number one, which is informational cascades. So when you think in politics how an idea spreads, whether the idea is we should have deregulation or whether the idea is that we should ban genetically modified food or label it, often that idea spreads not because every single person studies deregulation or GMOs, but because people are taking their cues from other people. That's how rebellions, large and small, happen. That's how people become very serious presidential candidates. That's how the Star Wars movies depict both the rise of the empire and the rise of the rebellion. There are cascade effects where people are taking their cues from others. And Luke, of course, at first didn't want to become a part of the rebellion, but he's taking a cue from others. And then Han takes it from Luke. And Leia, of course, was there at the beginning. She's like a, a true believer. And that is a very important phenomenon. We often think that people as a whole rise up in favor of some product or idea, but it's actually informational cues that sometimes through a very rapid spreading and sometimes it's, it's slower. Something becomes you know, common knowledge or uh, in everybody's house or uh, in the White House, and, and that's what's depicted. The success of Star Wars as a phenomenon is exactly the same process where um, the movie makers didn't have much faith in it. The uh, studio certainly had uh, very little faith in it. Uh, Lucas, the mind behind Star Wars, thought it might do as well as an average Disney movie, and that was at the high end of optimism. But there was a cascade of, this is amazing. And people were hearing other people say it was amazing, and eventually there were lines along the block. And once there are lines along the block, then uh, you can really create uh, a phenomenon. Once you hear there's a line around the block, you want to go stand at the line. Definitely. Yeah. Um, can Star Wars inform public policy? I think so. Uh, I don't think it's the first place I'd go <laughs> if I wanted to learn about public policy. I guess it depends on the policy uh, environment uh, you're talking about. <laughs> maybe go to some texts by people whose specialty is public policy. <laughs> sure. uh, but it does have uh, a few ideas. I think the one I'd single out is the immense importance and in some ways fragility of separation of powers. So uh, George Lucas uh, studied this stuff and you can see his emphasis on both the potential paralysis of a gridlocked legislature and the problems that calls for um, public faith and trust in institutions. He, he kind of got that in the much maligned prequels. And also the sense that in the face of a blocked, um, potentially corrupt and certainly sharply divided legislature, there's uh, pressure, public pressure, for a strong executive which is depicted in Star Wars as deeply threatening to liberty. And that's uh, a very fair thing for any democracy to worry over. And the idea of republic, of course, is the uh, kind of guiding political lodestar in Star Wars. And uh, Benjamin Franklin famously said, after the Constitution was written to the people in Philadelphia, we have uh, a Constitution, if you can keep it. Uh, you can think that the political message of Star Wars is exactly Franklin's. So uh, I think President Bush certainly would argue that he had a difficult Congress to deal with. President Obama would certainly argue he had a difficult Congress to deal with. Um, liberals would argue that President Bush took executive powers further than they should go. Conservatives would argue President Obama took executive powers further than, than they should go. Should we think of Presidents Bush and Obama as Emperor Palpatine? I don't think so. So uh, I think they both have faced constraints and th from a divided legislature, and they both had policy imperatives that they didn't succeed in getting through. And both of them, I think, uh, worked very carefully with lawyers uh, 
to try to do as much as they could to uh, establish policies that they thought were desirable and reflected the will of the American people, subject to the blockages that they faced. So uh, I, my view is that while reasonable people think both presidents overreached, uh, they are uh, uh, a zillion miles, thank goodness, away from uh, the emperor. <laughs> I think it's a subject of debate, uh, but it seems to me that the model of government of the Republic is the model that the Star Wars films favor. Do you think that, that that's the right model? Well, it depends on how we specify the idea of a republic. So if what we mean by a republic is a system of uh, popular rule where there are divided authorities, a system of checks and balances, where there are the equivalent of Jedi Knights, not an independent power center, but people who are kind of guardians like a, a secret service of some kind, um, that's the right ballpark. So I would see the Republic as depicted in Star Wars as in the same universe as America's constitutional Republic. And that can be specified in many different ways, but uh, so long as that's our general framework, uh, uh, that's a good one. Now I want to talk a little less about public policy. You write, for all its talk of destiny, Star Wars insists on freedom of choice. That's its largest lesson. Can you describe what you mean by that? And can you tell us why you believe in the existence of free will? Okay, so there's a link between what we've been discussing, that is the political commitment to republics and the individual tale of Star Wars. And I think that's what makes the somewhat cartoonish movies actually have a deep theme. Uh, the idea of authoritarian rule by someone who's a tyrant forcing people to do stuff is despised in Star Wars. And the idea that every individual, kind of every day, has the freedom to go one direction rather than another, that's kind of at the heart of Star Wars. So it comes up in small ways and scenes that don't seem to be political, mm -hmm. like when Obi-Wan says, You must do what you feel is right, of course. When Luke says he's not going to join the rebellion. And when, uh, this, in a bigger moment, uh, the Emperor Palpatine-to-be uh, says to Anakin, you must make a choice. You must choose! When uh, he himself, that is Palpatine, is, uh, is subject to getting killed and Anakin actually saves him. He makes a choice. So Han Solo makes a choice to come back and save Luke after Leia uh, says... He's got to follow his own path. No one can choose it for him. So that's all over Star Wars. And it's um, uh, in deep tension with the nominal theme of the movie, movies, which is about destiny and prophecy. So they seem to be all about, you know, it's been prophecy, this and that. Uh, and the emperor's always saying, Everything is proceeding as I have foreseen. Yoda really has the last word. He says, Difficult to see. Always in motion is the future. And that's connected with the freedom of choice theme. So I think the movie takes a stand in favor of freedom of choice. Uh, I don't have anything particularly deep to say about freedom of choice myself. I'd say two things. Uh, one is that there's a philosophical account of freedom of choice, which says that we have ideals as well as impulses, and we can live in accordance with our ideals. We can do that, and sometimes we do. And if we do, we're exercising our freedom rightly understood. I think that's a very appealing conception of freedom of choice, and it, it, it is in Star Wars. People who are exercising their freedom, they act in accordance with their ideals. The other thing I'd say uh, to the philosophical skeptics about free will, who have some things to say about genes and about the environment, that uh, human lived experience is, it's impossible to make sense of it, really, for just about anyone without uh, uh, having a kind of minute by minute, minute commitment to freedom uh, of, of choice and free, free will. So uh, there are pretty complicated arguments on this count, but uh, I will stick with lived experience. So we can think of freedom properly understood as the ability or the choice to do what you ought rather than the license to do what you want. I think that's, that's fair, not as a matter of what government should be doing. Mm -hmm. So if the government says we're going to 
make you do what you or we think it's best to do rather than your impulses, that would be kind of too Kantian a government. Mm -hmm. It would be intruding on people's desire, let's say, for chocolate or Mm -hmm. for a silly magazine this afternoon Mm -hmm. rather than self-improvement. So to to allow people in the private domain to make their own sortings of these things is, uh, that's a very important part of freedom. Mm -hmm. But at the individual level, if you are a slave to your impulses and you know, going in directions, it might be drugs, it might be uh, sloth, it might be any number of the things that are sometimes called sins, uh, which can be, you know, fun for the moment. Uh, then th- to say you're enslaved by your passions, that's, that's fair. That's a, a lack of freedom. And one way that people express their freedom, and this is a Star Wars theme, is they say, you know, my self-understanding is that I'm going to be a good citizen, uh, a good person, I'm going to be responsible. And when people follow those root paths, which are their own, uh, fit with their own deepest commitments, they're exercising their freedom. So it occurs to me as we're having this conversation, we're talking about Star Wars as a vehicle for understanding free will, freedom of choice, determinism, uh, empire and republic as forms of government. Are these children's movies? Should we think of these as children's movies? It's a great question. So George Lucas, the Star Wars mastermind, did think of them as for, you know, kids. Maybe not kids five and below, but kids. Mm -hmm. Uh, He got in touch both in the political domain and in the kind of mythic domain uh, with history, with religion, with culture in a way that went pretty deep. So uh, I I wouldn't say, again, that the best way to get a handle on public policy or thinking about republics or thinking about free will is to look at Star Wars, but the movies have had such cultural resonance for a reason. They did come out of Flash Gordon and uh, they were influenced by comic books in the 60s, uh, but they way outshot that stuff, I think, because of the just the sheer ambition of the people behind them. And that makes it, you know, improbably, uh, I think, I wouldn't have expected to spend so much time on the movies, but improbably they're, they're very rich. They're, they're not Shakespeare, but they are very rich. I was, I was struck by a passage that you um, put uh, uh, in the movie, I'm sorry, in the book, um, from a newspaper in February 1933. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read the passage. The power to dissolve parliament at his discretion and to rule Germany by decree without parliament was entrusted today to Adolf Hitler, Germany's new chancellor, by President Paul von Hindenburg. With that in mind, that really jumped off the page to me, um, what, are the, what are the big political lessons in Star Wars as you see them and how can we apply those lessons to today's politics? So doing this book, and I certainly didn't expect this, uh, turned me around at least a little bit on one political principle, uh, at least shift, a shift from what I think most law professors think. So there's a view, which is that broad delegations of authority to the executive branch, and arguably you can find them in the Occupational Safety and Health Act, in the uh, in the Clean Air Act, in uh, multiple regulatory statutes, there's a view that we shouldn't even trouble ourselves about broad delegations of authority by Congress to the executive because Congress has, uh, through the democratic processes and subject to the accountability it faces, chosen to do that. So it has a complete democratic pedigree and for a Clean Air Act regulation and Occupational Safety and Health Act regulation, uh, there's a lot of technical stuff and to expect uh, the senator of the House to figure out, you know, silica or mercury. That's just not realistic. So we have both a democratic pedigree and a respect for people who are immersed in the subject at hand. That's maybe a widespread view that is completely fine. Uh, and uh, I don't think the widespread view is is fundamentally wrong. But Star Wars is uh, raising a red flag which is if a legislature grants open-ended discretion, as in the case of uh, the loss of the republic, and as in the case of Germany, 
Uh, there is something to worry over that you don't have a specific uh, judgment by a diverse set of representatives of the people about what ought to be done. Now, all things considered, I wouldn't say that the Clean Air Act is unconstitutional or the Occupational Safety and Health Act is unconstitutional, but I would say that there's a kind of plea for bounding executive discretion, at least in the domain of domestic Mm -hmm. uh, affairs, that is uh, worth listening pretty carefully to. So I'd like to return to the to the issue of freedom of choice uh, to ask a question purely about the plot of of the first six movies. You write the two trilogies are about freedom of choice under nearly identical conditions. Um, I had never that had never occurred to me before. Can you can you explain what you mean by this? Uh, what the trilogies do that's ingenious. It's really brilliant. Is that In uh, the third released movie, Return of the Jedi, Luke faces a series of choices, um, many of the most difficult ones put to him by the Emperor or Darth Vader, whether to go to the dark side. Those choices are put to him under circumstances in which he can uh, uh, save himself in some Uh, literal sense from getting killed, but also embark on a life of authority and power. And he says at the key moments, no, I'm not going to do that. And you can see in Return of the Jedi that Luke comes very close to going to the dark side in his uh, fight with his dad. Uh, He comes not just close, he goes there. You can see it in the movies and in the novel, it's unambiguous that the dark side is with him. He goes there. But at the last moment, he retreats and says, You failed, Your Highness. I am a Jedi, like my father before me. Which I think has a claim in context to being one of the most moving lines in the history of motion pictures, even though it's in... Star Wars movies. That's how you close the book. Yeah. The, the, it's an overwhelming line, I think, given the entirety of the saga. Anakin, in the uh, second trilogy, the prequels, is in exactly the same position as Luke with the same interlocutor, Palpatine. And that makes it really interesting to think temporally that that suggests that in Return of the Jedi, Palpatine is knowingly replicating exactly what he did with Anakin. And so when he says everything's unfolding as I have foreseen, uh, he has had an experience that was the same. And Anakin, faced with the choice, uh, goes to the dark side, basically in order to save his beloved, who uh, Palpatine says, To cheat death is a power only one has achieved. But if we work together, I know we can discover And uh, that form of attachment that Anakin has is what leads him to the dark side. And Yoda says, Miss them, do not. Attachment leads to jealousy. The shadow of greed, that is. And he had that experience. That was the experience with Anakin. So it's all mirroring itself. Luke almost goes to the dark side because of attachment to his sister, whom uh, his father threatens. And then he goes dark, just like Anakin. If you will not turn to the dark side, then perhaps she will. But in the end, Anakin ends up replicating his own experience of attachment. That is, he can't bear to see his beloved die. In this case, his beloved is his son. And so he uh, saves his soul that way. It's really complicated stuff, yes, where the dark side is both the... Uh, the place you go because you're, you have know, intense attachment, and it's in the end the source of salvation, which makes, I think, the movies have a, have a big Christian theme. But the, the mirroring of one to the other is extremely precise. They're almost physically the same. The location of the emperor and Anakin in the prequels, the location of the emperor and uh, Luke in the original trilogy. So what, why do you think uh, Luke was able to, to surmount that temptation, but Anakin wasn't? Anakin's a pretty damaged guy. So he was a slave. He had no father. Maybe that's the simplest answer. He had no father at all, no male figure. He had a, you know, a childhood that was truncated by 
Uh, he's off with these guys who think he's the chosen one. Uh, he adores his mother, and he's severed from her. And then his mother's killed. So he's lost or abandoned or taken or uh, threatened at all these key moments. Luke has a good nuclear family of uh, loving aunt and uncle who raise him you know, it looks like in the best possible way. So by the time we see him at the age of 18 or 19 or 20, he's kind of regular. He's ambitious. He looks up at the sky with longing, but he's not, uh, there's nothing that's kind of taken uh, something out of his heart. To completely change topics, I have a short question, but it's very profound. Is the force God? Uh, you can think of it that way. Uh, the way the movies leave the Force has uh, interpretive ambiguity. Life creates it, makes it grow. Its energy surrounds us and binds us. Luminous beings are we, not this crude matter. The idea that the Force is God is not less reasonable than a number of other interpretations. So I think that is a fair one. What are some of the others? Well, I'll tell you one that I think is a, a, a strong secular competitor, and it came out uh, actually really recently. Lawrence Kasdan offhandedly was asked about movies and the themes of his movies, and he wrote several of the Star Wars movies with Lucas. And he said something like, you know, the best line he ever wrote was in Indiana Jones, where uh, Indiana Jones's buddy says, uh, you know, what's the plan? And uh, Harrison Ford, Indiana Jones, says, I don't know, I'm making it up as I go along. And he said, that's the best line I've ever written. And then Kasdan says, that's it. It's the biggest adventure you can have, making up your own life. He must be upwards of 70 now, Kasdan, he says, even now, I don't know what I'm going to do tomorrow, let alone the day after tomorrow. I'm making up my own day. It's, it's infinite possibility. And then he says, I think not intending to answer your question, but he says these words, it's the life force. So I think that sense of freedom and possibility, that uh, you can choose your own path, you can give that a religious foundation, by the way. It has a root in Christianity. Um, but if, if you don't like that one, you can give it a secular and I think deeply American mm -hmm. reading, and, and, and that's there too. It brings us back to freedom to choose. Um, the movies have many religious overtones. Do you, do you think of the movies as, as mostly Christian? Are they mostly Buddhist? Um, are, they, are, they, are they neither, some mix of the two? I think they're mostly Christian in a way that uh, you can admire or love even if you're not Christian. So I'll, I'll tell you why I think they're mostly Christian. I don't know if Lucas self-consciously intended this. My guess is not. But there, it's a tale of redemption. Both Luke and Anakin can see, be seen as Christ figures. And one of them dies actually uh, 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 to save his child, to save all children, to restore balance to the Force. It really can be seen as a kind of crucifixion. Uh, it's a twist on the crucifixion uh, of Jesus Christ because it's, you know, there's voluntary action where he goes light, kills the emperor, and he's dying because of all that. But he is a Christ figure. And uh, Luke is the, is the same. I think the kind of beating Christian heart of Star Wars is about salvation, where um, Lucas has said that uh, the real story of the six movies is the tragedy of Darth Vader. Uh, I have reverence for uh, George Lucas, and I disagree with him. It's not the tragedy of Darth Vader. It's the redemption of Darth Vader. So Vader, in the end, uh, saves um, his son, and in that beautiful scene where he looks at his son with his own eyes, uh, Luke says, Leave me? No, you're coming with me. I'll not leave you here. I've got to save you. And Vader, now called, by the way, in the script, Anakin. The only time in hmm. the script of the original trilogy that he's called Anakin. He's called Anakin there, hmm. not Vader anymore. Anakin says... You already have, Luke. And that's 
uh, that's a redemption tale about, I think it's about the soul. And when you see uh, Anakin at the end of Return of the Jedi, you see him standing with the other Force ghosts. His soul is saved. He's in, in the Star Wars equivalent of heaven. I've always thought it was interesting. You know, when I, when I watched the original trilogy, I, I thought it was the story of Luke. And it never even occurred to me it would be anything else. And then when the prequels came along, the entire set of six movies, I agree with you, clearly is, is the story of Darth Vader. Um, I wonder what we'll be saying after the next three are completed. Do you have any, any it's speculation? It's a great question. It's a great question. And they can take it in a lot of different directions. Uh, I bet they themselves have figured it out. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the cheap answer would be to say it will be a story of Kylo Ren, that he will emerge as the, uh, as the uh, central figure. I don't think that will happen. One reason is that Darth Vader, the fact that the tale became, as you say, a tale of Darth Vader, I'm pretty confident that occurred to Lucas quite late. He, Vader only had nine minutes of screen time in A New Hope. In the early drafts of what became A New Hope, Darth Vader was a, a tiny character. There's reason to think that Darth Vader was going to get really small in some of the other two movies, in the original trilogy, in Empire and Return of the Jedi. He was almost subordinate to Moff Tarkin. Enough of this. Vader, release him. As you wish. <clears throat> yes, definitely. And, and he kind of ran away with that in a way that's both... Uh, in terms of the creation of narrative and psychologically super interesting. I think it's because he's the most compelling character in uh, A New Hope and that Lucas must have known that and felt it. He created this woe guy. And while Kylo Ren is promising, uh, he's a little too much of a kid, I think, to, to take over. Too many temper tantrums. Too many temper tantrums. Good actor, but he doesn't have the, the menace. Yeah. So we'll see. So I want to ask uh, about uh, an alternative interpretation of the films. Under this interpretation, uh, uh, the argument goes, the Jedi were terrible at their jobs. They chose to train Anakin Skywalker as a Jedi, even though they had great trepidation about that. They allowed Palpatine to seize power right from under their noses. They were completely ignorant to the creation of the clone army. Society was in chaos. Order was needed, which the Empire brought. The Jedi then became a band of religious fanatics trying to destroy the order brought by the Empire. With our combined strength, we can end this destructive conflict and bring order to the galaxy. I'll never join you! The Jedi are the true enemy. The Empire is the true hero. What say you? Well, I, I don't agree with that interpretation, but the fact that the... Films depict the Empire with something other than, let's say, um, completely clear disgust. And the films describe republics with something other than unambivalent enthusiasm introduces a nice tension into the movies. So just as Darth Vader's darkness is something that kind of runs away with the movies, uh, the Emperor's quest for order and, you know, uh, what is it, clarity of governance or something, uh, uh, has some seductive power, I think. Uh, so that makes the, the tension between the two, and it's very much in The Force Awakens, where the First Order is humanly recognizable. It's not just, you know, crazy people. It's people who have a view that we can see maybe in some part of our own minds also, thinking order is really important and chaos is uh, one of the worst things in, in governance. So I think it, that's a, that is picking up on something. But the Star Wars movies is not pro-Empire. So when Luke says in A New Hope... It's not that I like the Empire, I hate it, but there's nothing I can do about it right now. I'm not for the em Empire, I hate it. Uh, Luke, whose name is like Lucas, he's speaking as kind of every man on that count. So warts and all, uh, a republic is superior to an authoritarian system. Uh, I want to ask a question about the droids. So we see very early on uh, in A New Hope that C-3PO and R2-D2 have what seems to be a real connection. Uh, we see in The Force Awakens that uh, R2-D2 and, and, and Luke Skywalker have a, have a very real 
connection. And that thread runs throughout all seven films. Are the droids slaves? And should we think of Luke Skywalker uh, as the moral equivalent of a slave owner? I don't think so. Um, The relationship between the Star Wars universe and technology is super interesting. So it is true that the droids have uh, deeply human qualities that can run away certainly with children, but uh, everyone responds to them. Uh, At the same time, they are machines, and Darth Vader, when he goes bad, he becomes kind of mostly machine. If there were cruelty to, emotional cruelty to C-3PO or R2-D2, that would be uh, extremely unpleasant and kind of brutal. So I don't know if they can feel pain, probably not, but you can imagine something that would hurt their feelings. Mm-hmm. They have feelings, mm-hmm. and that would be wrong. No, I don't think he likes you at all. No, I don't like you either. So I'm groping a little bit with this question to see, see them a little bit more as analogous to horses or dogs. Mm. Uh, which shouldn't be treated cruelly, but it wouldn't be right to characterize them as, as slaves. No. Um, in the book, I, I was very pleased to see you mentioned an episode of Star Trek The Next Generation called uh, The Inner Light. We hoped our probe would encounter someone in the future, someone who could be a teacher, someone who could tell the others about us. me, isn't it? I'm the someone. I'm the one it finds. And you say that that's your favorite Star Trek episode. It happens to be my favorite Star Trek episode, too. Uh, You write uh, that the inner light, quote, gets close to the center of the human heart. Star Wars does that, too, but nothing in it quite compares to the inner light. Why do you think that Star Wars failed to achieve what Star Trek was able to achieve? Well, I I think that Star Trek at its best had uh, novelistic qualities. It has a literary sensibility at its best. What uh, Star Wars has at its best, it has our artistic genius. Incredible visuals that, that are truly like an artist. Um, I wouldn't say that Star Trek is is better in the inner light than Star Wars is. Let's say at its best moments, I'd say that the way that Star Trek is great in the inner light, Star Wars just is never great in that way. Mm-hmm. And one reason is that what is it? There's something about novelistic complexity mm-hmm. that Star Trek is capable of, has been capable of, and Star Wars to date has, doesn't have novelistic complexity. It, it can be a little like a, a painting where you can recognize stuff that is primal, but it's not like a novel where you see the bounds of the, uh, bounds in the sense of leaps rather than limits, uh, leaps and bounds of the plot that are a little like Dickens. So the inner light is a little like Dickens. It, it builds on some of that tradition. And uh, the people behind Star Wars, they, they, they are more movie people mm-hmm. than they are uh, story people. Do you think it's just an issue of medium? Do you think that television creates an opportunity to play with some of those literary themes in a way that... I think that's part of it. But I think that the minds behind Star Trek just had different... Uh, uh, they're d- very different sensibilities. So Gene Roddenberry, the, the Star Trek kind of impresario, he, he was drawn to tales, and he hired a lot of great writers, novelists, people who you know, uh, wrote things that had nothing to do with anything visual, and th- they developed these plots. So Harlan Ellison, one of the great science fiction writers of the last hundred years, wrote... Uh, the first drafts, at least, of City on the Edge of Forever, which is one of the great Star Star Trek episodes. Deliberately so, Top Jim. I could have saved her. Do you 
know what you just did. He knows, Doctor. He knows. And that's just a Har Harlan Ellison isn't a Star Wars guy. Yeah. He's a Star Trek guy. So I think it's the, 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 the novelistic sensibility versus the, the artist. Yeah. I want to ask a question about, about redemption. You emphasize the role that redemption plays in Star Wars, and, and Darth Vader is the obvious example. Uh, we, we got The Force Awakens, and we see um, another father and son struggling with lightsabers, and Han Solo was killed. Are we supposed to think that Han Solo somehow was redeemed in that act? It's a, gr it's a great question. And uh, I'll tell you one person who was redeemed in that act, for worse, and that is Lawrence Kasdan. <laughs> Lawrence Kasdan had been pleading for someone important to die for years, mm -hmm. and he lost and he got redeemed. Uh, now Kasdan's a great man, and I say, wrong choice. So uh, he doesn't go to hell, but, uh, but he, it's, it's a point against him that he got uh, Han Solo killed. In terms of the characters, I think we don't know yet whether Han Solo needed redemption. So maybe we'll find out in some of the next episodes whether he was kind of a creepo father who in this last act of self -sacrifice, failed self-sacrifice, he was doing something which was kind of comparable to what uh, Darth Vader did for his son. Uh, I like to think that Han Solo is unlikely to have been the, you know, one of the worst persons, one of the worst people in the universe types as, as uh, Vader was, and that he was more just like a loving dad who was trying to save his son and thought there was a shot and failed. I think the redemption we're going to see is not Han Solo, and this is a prediction. I have no private knowledge, no information, but I think we're going to see Kylo Ren redeemed. And contrary to my view, which is Kasdan made the wrong choice, as did Abrams, uh, a salute to these people who know what they're doing, but I think they made their wrong choice in getting Han Solo killed. They might in the end have gotten it right, because if Kylo Ren's redemption is going to be meaningful, he has to have done something really horrific so that you don't think of him as this whining kid, but you think of him as someone who engaged in patricide, killed one of the most beloved characters in the Star Wars universe. So they maybe had to do that to make what I am uh, guessing is going to be his eventual redemption, to make it not, uh, not trivial. In the book, you ask whether Star Wars was lucky, well-timed, or just awesome. Can you describe those three theories and, and let us know which, which you think it was. Okay, so I'll tell you the one of the three that I think is not correct, though it's the most tempting, is, which is that it's well-timed. So many people who've studied the, the period from politicians to film types say that Star Wars uh, hit the culture at a, in exactly the period it needed to. So uh, Cold War, Evil Empire, Soviet Union, kind of demoralized America, post-Jimmy Carter, uh, there were the assassinations of uh, JFK and RFK and Martin Luther King. There was Vietnam. There, the country needed a new hope. It needed something light and upbeat and uplifting that would uh, be basically an American tale. And in a way, I think it's fair to say it's a, a tale of American greatness. I don't think it was so intended, but I think it is, is easily seen that way. So it hit the culture at exactly the right time. It was bound to be great. Now, that is a tempting explanation. A lot of smart people think it. I don't think it. Because if Star Wars had hit the culture, let's say, in the 40s or 50s or 30s or 90s or after 9-11, you could say, perfect timing. It did spectacularly. You know, after the Depression, we needed that in the 30s. Or after the attacks of 9-11, we needed that. Or after the Great Recession, you see, in the 50s, we kind of were happy people. We wanted a happy movie that would fit. So oh, these, these fits with the culture explanations. They're always available, and they're extremely speculative. So I don't buy that one. Uh, my head says that the uh, luck explanation is correct. 
Uh, I go with my heart on this, but let me spell out the head. The, the head explanation says uh, the studio had little faith in it. The actors had basically no faith in it. Uh, they wasn't shown in a lot of theaters when it was first released. But it got some early buzz of the most enthusiastic kind that it was really like a snowball that got bigger and bigger. And some things are like that. You know, I think both the Obama campaign and the Trump campaign have been like that. Apple, in certain periods, has been exactly like that. Now, that isn't to say that Trump and Obama and Apple lack appeal. Obviously, they all have appeal. But the early social influences with the, with the snowball getting bigger and bigger as people said, this is great, this is great, this is great. And there's a certain serendipity involved in the mounting size of the snowball as certain people are talking to other people in a way that creates an amplified signal that gets so loud that eventually everybody's hearing it. That's what happened to Star Wars. That's what happened to uh, Harry Potter. That's what happened to uh, Star Trek at a certain time. It's happened to Taylor Swift. She is great. I'm a big Taylor Swift fan. But it's not inevitable that Taylor Swift would be the hugest singer of our time. She got this kind of luck. You need to be good, but, but to get this this uh, social influence stuff going. So my head says that's what made Star Wars, which is not to diminish it at all, but it's to say that it got the, the luck. What my head says is, take a look at that first scene in A New Hope. What your heart says. What my heart says, sorry. Uh, uh, my heart is, is creating a Freudian slip in favor of head. <laughs> my heart says, don't you say it's me. It's your head too. But uh, my heart says, take a look at that scene where the... Uh, the Imperial Destroyer is, is just so big and it, you see it and you're underneath it and it goes on and on. It's, it's like a joke. It goes on for so long. And audiences rose and cheered. No one expected it, but they couldn't, they never see anything like that. So what my heart says is that this is one of those few things that really are so awesome and amazing that they were going to do well. We, uh, I, I was also pleased to see uh, a Bruce Springsteen quote in the book, and we had a little Twitter exchange about that last night. Uh, I trust that you would agree that, that Bruce Springsteen's success is also because of just inherent awesomeness. He's completely awesome. <laughs> well, he, it's not for no reason that he's called the boss. <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad we could come together on that. <laughs> um, uh, I want to ask a question about the prequels. The prequels have received a lot of criticism. Do you think that the amount of criticism they've received is misplaced? Um, especially if we control for bad acting and bad dialogue, if we, if we take those two out. Uh, how do you think the prequels stack up? I think it's time to love the prequels. We are ready to love the prequels. And to, to explain, Including the Phantom Menace. I think we can, we we're ready to love all of them. Okay. Uh, and let me say a little bit why. So uh, Revenge of the Sith is actually, I think, a terrific movie. It's not a flawless movie, but it's a terrific movie. So the volcano scene is amazing. Uh, Anakin's turn to the dark side is uh, extremely difficult to watch in times. That's the only one, by the way, that I haven't seen all the way through with my now seven-year-old boy. It's just too hard for a kid. And the fact that it's too hard for a kid is in this case a tribute to its artistry. It's just done in a way that's emotionally not dismissible. a tough movie in a good way. Uh, the fact, as, as we discussed, that there's such mirroring of Return of the Jedi, that's fantastic. Uh, the closing scenes, I think, are really good. So that, that's a strong movie. Um, I think it belongs with The Force Awakens as two very, very good movies, and probably Return of the Jedi also. Three very, very good movies. They're just short of great, but they're, uh, you know, as movies go as part of our culture go, they are uh, ach real achievements. Uh, uh, Attack of the Clones, I think, is the most underrated in the bunch. Uh, to watch it now, it's really fun. It has life and energy. The opening scenes are, are good between Obi-Wan and Anakin. The Anakin actor maybe isn't 
on the best actor that uh, uh, American movies have ever seen. But uh, but so okay, I think at Attack of the Clones, not not hopeless, and and it's visually, you know, there's just so much going on. How do we do all that? If you look at even one scene for five minutes, there's just so many things going on. Uh, the Phantom Menace is not uh, the best of the seven so far, and it does have some cornball dialogue and some kind of excruciating stuff in it. It it does have good scenes. The the fight scene in the Darth Maul is, is excellent. <laughs> Uh, the pod racing one is scene is done very well, and it's, the scenes are visually pretty interesting. Little kids love it. I, I know one who, who loves it, uh, so I, I I think it's it's all right. I, it shouldn't be disparaged, and I give Lucas for all three uh, a standing ovation for uh, uh, the, the guy isn't cautious. He, he doesn't repeat himself. Uh, at least not as much as he might have. And the, the three prequels are, you know, they go, go places that he had gone at all. So uh, I think in a way, you know, this is one of our great cultural producers, and I, I, I think he deserves a break. He, he took quite a beating for the prequels and you know, uh, put a lot of effort, and there, there's a lot of good stuff there. Um, now I want to ask you the question America is asking. Who is Snoke? Well, I actually know, but if I said there's a drone that would come from Disney <laughs> Studios, uh, which has Snoke's name on it, that might get you as well as me. So you, you, you'll tell me say. off camera. No, no, no. Sworn to secrecy. <laughs> I, 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 I should say I don't know. Okay. Um, you raise an interesting possibility in the book, a possibility that, that, that some people uh, uh, discuss. Was Jar Jar Binks intended to be a Sith Lord? Uh, he was not. So he was intended to be a kind of cute uh, C-3PO second generation person who would be comic relief and entertaining for the kids. And Lucas actually, when he was criticized so much for Jar Jar Binks, said in some interviews, you know, they said C-3PO was terrible and idiotic, and this is, this is, people are going to see this is great. Now, that was not an unerring prediction on his part. People haven't come to love Jar Jar Binks decades later. But the ingenious uh, efforts by observers to say that Jar Jar Binks was like Yoda and was in the end going to be a, a Darth uh, Lord, uh, sometimes ingenuity outruns fact. And just as some conspiracy theories and some readings of literary texts are, whoa, theories, but not really, it's not really that, you know, if you take every fourth letter of some language <laughs> the Bible was in, then you're going to see a prediction that Donald Trump was going to have the Republican <laughs> nomination. Probably not. Um, I thought Lucas did a good job finding a role for Jar Jar in the subsequent two films. Yes. Do you I agree? Th I think he was very responsive to the fact that it, it kind of didn't work. Yeah. And to abandon the character entirely would be a little, um, what is it, a little random. Mm -hmm. He played a big role. But uh, to make it make a smaller character, I think he was responsive. to it, it didn't work. Especially given The Force Awakens. Do you think that the Skywalker family plays too big a role in galactic affairs to be credible? It's a very good question. So I'm thinking a little bit, uh, are the, one of our families, Kennedys or Bushes or Clintons, playing an unexpectedly and kind of not quite credibly large role? Mm -hmm. Now, it's true that as important as the Kennedys and the Bushes and the Clintons have been, they are not as important as the Skywalkers. And Darth Vader, Luke Skywalker, Kylo <laughs> yeah. Ren, all blood relatives. Yeah, so I think it's fair to say this uh, uh, strange credulity. But it might not be the first candidate for credulity straining of the various things in Star Wars. Faster than light travel. <laughs> yeah, and then parsecs. I mean, as fast as the Millennium Falcon is, it can't do the Kessel Run. You can't do that in <laughs> yes. less than 12 parsecs. Yes. Um, well... Thank you very much for, for sitting with us, and, and we have an event upstairs, and I'm looking forward to that as well. Thank you. Much enjoyed it. <laughs>